What's up everyone, welcome to Workshop Rebuild. In today's episode, I'll be back on the Bones HD20 rerig and I'll be reassembling everything. For that, I have a new Bones HD20 bull gear. I recently purchased this and I had a look at it and it seems to be an improved version over the old style. So we'll have a look at the bull gears first, the old and the new, and then once we cover that, we'll move on to the rebuild process. Once that's complete, I'll install it back into the machine, bring the Bowens inside and install the electric fuel pump. So I have both bull gears laid out on the table. I'll share with you guys the old and the new bull gear and I'll share with you guys my personal opinion what I think is good on the old one and what is good on the new one. So let's dig right into it. On the left of the screen I have my new bull gear which I recently purchased and on the right I have the old bull gear which came out of the Bones HT20 rear end. The new bull gear which I have right here is a used bull gear but it is in pristine condition. All the internals seem to be just fine. I measured everything beforehand and it's exactly the same size as the old one. I'll talk about the old one first. I'll share with you all the components around the old one and then I'll share with you the new one and the internal components on this bull gear. So first of all the old bull gear is very damaged as you guys can see. I could have rotated this 90 degrees and machined two slots on either side of this bull gear and made sure that the old pin which holds the two running gears will fit within the bull gear as you guys can see on the end of this shaft there are two cutouts and those cutouts would locate within this bull gear that would look something like this but as you guys can see it has worn to the right and to the left of this bull gear and that is internally not as strong as it used to be. So I shared with you the old bull gear and now I'll move on to the new bull gear and share with you the differences from the new to the old. So looking at the new bull gear right off the bat you will see the cutouts are still intact and the cutouts in general as well as the inside shape of this bull gear is much different to the old one. The old one is fully cast and the new one which I have in front is machined around the perimeter of the inside of this bull gear. These marks on the sidewall are roughing cuts and that's why you will have these little steps or grooves on this sidewall. So the inside of this bull gear has been completely machined to size as well as on the top and bottom where the shaft for the running gears sits. The next thing I'll focus on are both shafts which hold the running gears on the old and the new bull gear. I will mention the old bull gear is just cylindrical all the way through. It is a hardened shaft. And then on the end we have these two steps left and right on both sides which would locate within the bull gear. Obviously it is damaged but the bull gear would have had the exact same steps externally which will hold these steps in place that would have been placed inside and that would position itself within the bull gear. There's not too much to talk about on the old one since I cannot reuse the bull gear but on the new one they made a complete new redesign and this is how it looks like. This is an assembly of parts so we have the top portion which is a certain half of this pin then we have a hardened dowel pin right there that's in the middle and then we have the bottom portion which is exactly the same as the top portion as you guys can see they're exactly identical but then within the top one we have a spring right there so now when we put this assembly together like this with the dowel pin on the inside and the bottom half once again you will see there's a space in between and we can now push this together like that so now when we place this within the bull gear we're going to have to compress the spring and this will always push outward and that will keep it locked in place as well as these tabs on the outside as you guys can see there is still a step right here which will locate within the bull gear but this tab is much larger than it ever was on the original one like that you guys can see that there's also much more surface where it'll contact within the bull gear so this redesign is a little bit better. I wouldn't say it's the best way 
to make an improvement, but I suppose uh, it will hold better over time, possibly because there is a bigger surface to touch within the bull gear. Looking at the running gears, these are very damaged on the old one, and in the back, they do not have any step or anything. So basically this surface right here was touching within the bull gear. And that's why I assume as well, there was a little bit of damage on the outside of this running gear, as well as a lot of damage within the bull gear. Bolens then went on to make a same running gear. This is exactly identical to the old one. There's nothing different on these two. The ID, which is the inside diameter, the OD and the number of teeth are exactly the same. But Bolens went ahead and added a hardened washer behind the gear. So when you think about this, if this is resting behind the gear like that, it will never touch the back surface of the gear on the inside of that bull gear. I think that's a very important thing to do. Uh, in the design process, you would not want these, uh, the back end of these teeth to actually touch or grind against the inside of that bull gear. Uh, with this washer, it'll give the perfect amount of space to uh, also locate these running gears onto the half axles. So I just shared with you the old Bowens bull gear design and the new design which I have right in front of me. The old design is obviously destroyed especially the internals of the bowl gear. The new design is, in my opinion, already a step better, but I'm going to have to see how long it actually does last and how much better it really is. But for now, I'm going to get into the time lapse of the rebuild process over here. I did do a 10 down video on this, and in that video, everything is a little bit slowed down. In this video, I'll assemble it a little bit faster, as I mentioned, like a time lapse. So once everything is together, I will go outside, put this back onto the Bowens HG20, and then I'll put two tires on it and bring it right here in this position. All I need to do is put the rear end on and two tires just to drag it in the shop. And then after it's in the shop, I'll add the hydraulic motor onto it, all the panels, the brakes, and I'll line everything up neatly so everything is in line with the engine.
I'll cut the time lapse right here, and in front of me is the Bolens HT20 rear end, fully assembled once again. I made sure that all the bearings, the seals, and all the shims within this housing are to size, and that they are fully functional. Now, since the rear end is done, I will take this part only and go to the Bolens HT20, mount it on there, add the hubs, add the wheels, and drag the Bolens inside of here because it's nice and warm outside. It's snowy, so I really hope I can get this done today. Bring the Bolens in here, and then we'll work some more on the Bolens. So I just made it outside. The Bolens is right behind me here. I took off the rear fender as well as the tarp that was on top, and this is the weather I'm dealing with today. But either way, I'm gonna put on that rear axle on the Bolens right now, and then I'll put on the tires and move this into the shop. here in the workshop I brought the Bowens HG20 through that deep snow and it's back here in the corner. I did not assemble the hydraulic motor onto the rear end because there is no oil within the system as of right now. I did not want the transmission to turn over the hydraulic pump which is the rear end of this assembly here. Now what I'll do is take off the rear end. I will assemble this together and then mount it onto the drive shaft and the two auxiliary hydraulics which go on top of the motor. Once that's assembled, I can add all the accessories like the brakes, the wheels, the wheel weights, and everything on the rear end. Then I'll come to the front and give you guys a close-up view on how to install an electric fuel pump for a 20 horsepower Bolt HD20.
except for the seat. I will leave that away because I'm gonna let that gasket material dry for about 24 hours. So I'll come back in here tomorrow and then I will add automatic transmission fluid into the rear end. I mentioned before, I'll add an electric fuel pump to this system that will lie between the fuel tank and the carburetor. I will need a positive wire that has power and a ground wire that will go to the base frame of this Bolens. So now I'm gonna go ahead and share with you guys the fuel pump on the side table over here. So this right here is the electric fuel pump. I purchased this on Amazon. Uh, you can find this anywhere on eBay probably, or even possibly somewhere locally. Uh, this is one of the smallest fuel pumps you can purchase. Um, this is good for anything up to 20 horsepower, I would say. And uh, you can install these between the fuel tank and the carburetor, which is on your machine. Uh, this fuel pump comes with two wires. The red one in this case uh, is indicated on the front face of this fuel pump. The red wire is positive and the black wire is our negative wire. So we need 12 volts to this system. So we'll add 12 volts to the red wire and the black wire will hook up to our main frame, which is on the Bolens HT20. I might not use this connector right here, but you can take these ends on the wires out of this connector, hook these up separately. So that means you can pull the red wire closer to where your power is coming from and the black wire you can basically hook up anywhere on the main frame. I shared with you guys the electric fuel pump on the bench over here and I installed the fuel pump on the Bolens HC20 off camera. I didn't really think the footage was good enough to share with you guys, but I will give you guys an in-depth view right now how it looks on the Bolens HC20 and what you guys have to look for if you would like to install your own electric fuel pump. So I just popped open the hood and the Kohler K532 is exposed. I have my 12 volt battery right here and the fuel pump is mounted externally close to the frame of the Bolens HG20. Now when mounting one of these electric fuel pumps, it's really important to mount it between the fuel tank and your carburetor in this instance. So the carburetor is right here under the air filter and our fuel tank is right behind the battery. So now you really wanna make sure that the fuel pump is somewhere in between. You could mount the fuel pump all the way in the back, but that means you're gonna be running more wire and you're gonna be running more hose. Another thing to mention on this electric fuel pump is that you do not want too much heat or vibration around it. Um, that could cause an internal failure uh, just from some heat. I was thinking of mounting it onto the engine, but I know these engines vibrate a whole bunch and these air-cooled engines, they do get hot when they're running. So I want it to get away from the engine and the only spot between the carburetor and the fuel tank is from the engine forward. So now up front on the Bolens, we have a pulley which then goes to our PTO and that has three belts. That is underneath the battery in the fuel tank. So there's not much room there and I don't really want any wires or hoses running around any belts. So I went for the external option, which is right here. There are actually two bolts on the Bolens, which are the perfect distance for this fuel pump right here. Another thing to mention is if you mount the fuel pump externally, you always have to make sure that nothing's gonna bump it. So now in my case right here, close to the battery, uh, especially since the hood comes a little bit back. It covers it just a little bit. I will test this out and see how it goes for me, but I think for right now, it's the perfect position to mount this external fuel pump. The first thing I did after I bolted the fuel pump onto the frame was to add my fuel hose. So the fuel hose runs from the fuel pump to the carburetor that is pushing the fuel to the carburetor, but the closer distance is from the fuel tank to the fuel pump. This pump is specifically designed to push fuel better than it is to suck. So the closer your fuel pump is to the fuel tank, the better. These electric fuel pumps have an inline filter, but if you guys would like to install another inline filter, you can do so from the fuel tank to the electric fuel pump. After I installed the fuel hoses, I went ahead and dealt with the wiring. The system that we have on the Bolens is a positive, which will go to our fuel pump, and the negative will hook up to our frame. That is our negative. So what I did right here, I hooked up the negative to the same bolt, which goes to our frame. So what I did, I did not cut that wire shorter in any way. I wrapped it around the fuel pump and made sure it's not loose in any way and added it to one of the bolts on the frame. Next, I took the red wire, which is our positive, which we do need power to the fuel pump and brought it up along with the fuel hose. And I have a connector right here. 
Now, what's important for the fuel pump is that we have power when it's in the on position, so that is turning the key over once, that's uh, to activate your lights and some of your gauges. Next up, you also want power when your ignition is in the start position, so that means when your starter solenoid is activated, you also need power to the fuel pump. So in both positions of your key, you would like the fuel pump to be powered. For that, you'll need a multimeter to come over to your ignition switch and check which of those points on the ignition switch have power at those specific settings. So looking at this red wire down below, it leads into a black wire. Unfortunately, I did not have any red wires, but this is a 16 gauge wire, which I hooked up right here. I have a female disconnect right here, which then leads into my ignition switch. What I was mentioning before is that when we have our key in our off position, we need power to the fuel pump in the on position, which is right here, like that. And you can hear the pump going. And then we also need power to the fuel pump when it's in the start position. So my ignition switch is right here and I'll now take it off the connector in the back. And on this connector, we have five prongs or points. So we have one right here, which is for our starter solenoid. And then we have four more down below. On the back of your ignition switch, you should have some indications. This one right here, which is our top left when we look at it, is for our battery. So power in will be coming into this point of the ignition switch. Our starter solenoid is the very top of the five and we have some other points so these are for our external lights and so on but now we have to check with our multimeter when we have it in the off position and we turn it once over like that which prongs open up so from our battery point to the other prongs we have to make sure we have continuity between any of these prongs right here and to do so i will give you guys a bench test Okay, I have the multimeter right in front of me and I will set it at 2K, so that's for continuity, just like that. Now we have a one. This multimeter does not beep when you touch, but when I touch it, it will go to zero or close to zero. So we have point or we have exactly zero. So that's perfect right there. And now when I take the key, this is our off position right here. I wanna turn it once and I wanna make sure we have continuity between certain poles. So the red one, the red lead will go to our battery pole. And I'm gonna shut it off right now. And now I should not have any continuity throughout the whole ignition switch. Checking all the prongs or points, zero. That's perfect. Now I'm gonna turn it once over. That is our on position for lights and other options. Now I'm gonna go around and see where we have continuity. So right here on this prong, that's our top right, we have continuity between these points. Our bottom right, we have continuity, a little bit more resistance. And our bottom left, we have continuity again. There's the least amount of resistance is between these two poles right here. And then this one on the bottom right also shows a little bit resistance. So we have power from our battery to these three poles on the bottom section of the ignition switch. Now, another thing I have to make sure is that when it's in the on position, which is like this in our start, that will spring back by itself. I need to make sure that our points on the ignition switch also have power or continuity. So this will be a little bit hard to share, but I'll try my best to do it. I have to turn the key like that, put the power on, put the red lead onto the pin and check for continuity once again. Just like that on the top right, I have continuity. On the bottom right, I do not have any continuity anymore. So that withdraws power or takes power away from this pin. And on the bottom left, I have continuity as well. So now what that tells me is that I can have the leading wire or the positive wire for the fuel pump coming to the bottom left or the top right pin of this ignition switch. Bringing you in close to this connector, this black wire right here leads to our top right pin 
that will come down through the harness, come to this connector. I still have to put heat shrink around this connector, but that leads down into our fuel pump. So this right here is 12 volts. And I will turn over the key right now to share with you guys the fuel pump in working condition. So that's basically it for the electric fuel pump. All you need is a good ground, which is your black wire on the electric fuel pump. And you need a positive for the red wire, which goes into the fuel pump. The red wire can go anywhere on your wiring harness, basically. But you'd like to hook it up to the ignition switch because that's where your power is coming in to your system. So in my case, the top right pin on the ignition switch was the proper pin. Your ignition switch may have more points or even have a different point which will use power or have power for the fuel pump. I managed to install the electric fuel pump on my Bose HG20 over here. Like I mentioned before, these are good for around 20 horsepower. Anything above, you might need a bigger fuel pump, but these are readily available and they come in different sizes so you guys can purchase the one that suits your application. I went ahead and added automatic transmission fluid to the rear end, so that's topped off. As the engine runs, I may have to add a little bit more very soon, as of right now, I will fill up the fuel tank with fuel and we'll get this thing started right now. As you guys just heard, I managed to get the Bullets HT20 up and running again with that straight pipe. It's really loud, so there's a huge echo within this shop. I managed to assemble the rear end as well as install the electric fuel pump. The big question for the Bullets HT20 is does it drive forward and does it drive in reverse? And for that, I will have to make another video because this video is already getting really long. So I'll make another video on the Bullets HT20. I'll hook up the front blade, which is a snow blade. And I'll go outside and give you guys some action shots. So stay tuned for the next episode.